Two visions for Latin America come together at the CELAC Summit in Quito. Plus, Colombians welcome the UN Security Council's decision to oversee the end of the conflict there. For Tell Us Our English, I'm Cody Weddle. Thanks for joining us. This is From the South. Latin American lawmakers have gathered in Quito, Ecuador for CELAC's uh, fourth annual summit. The lawmakers met at the National Assembly in Quito, Ecuador to discuss different issues such as inequality and social welfare programs that are being implemented in different nations around the region. Now, the meeting comes ahead of the arrival of 22 heads of government that's set for this Wednesday. And our correspondent Luis Arroyo is there in Quito ahead of the summit. Parliamentaries from Latin America and the Caribbean have met today in the National Assembly of Ecuador to create a draft that they will present to their presidents that will attend tomorrow the fourth summit of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. For the very first time, this regional alliance is divided in two. In the group of countries that support the imperialist interest over the natural resources of this wealthy region, and the other group of countries that support the progressive governments that have always seek to create an alliance in this region of the world. Luis Arroyo, Telesur, Quito. And one of the big surprises of the summit has been new Argentinian President Mauricio Macri's his decision not to attend. Now critics claim this reflects his ideological stance towards the region. With more now, our correspondent Leonel Poletti reports from Buenos Aires. After paying homage to global neoliberalism at the annual World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland last week, Argentine President Mauricio Macri will not be joining his Latin American counterparts at the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States Summit to be held Wednesday in Quito, Ecuador. Macri's medical staff announced that his absence is due to health issues related to a rib injury he endured earlier this month. They say that Quito's high altitude could be a health risk. The argument regarding Quito's altitude is quite odd. I think he does not want to see himself face to face with Nicolas Maduro, nor does he want to look into the eyes of Evo Morales, or have Evo look at him, but nor Rafael Correa who will host the summit. During his trip to the Davos summit, Macri publicly announced that he was pain free and well on the road to a full recovery. All of a sudden, his injury again takes center stage and keeps the Argentine president well away from the fourth CELAC summit, where Argentina is expected to be scrutinized regarding the imprisonment without trial of social activist Milagro Sala. Macri does not want to pay the political price of the issue of Milagro Sala's imprisonment being brought up in the plenary of the CELAC summit. Macri gave clear evidence at the Davos summit that he aims for unrestricted economic liberalization with the US and the EU. Many say that this will be a detriment to the Latin American regional integration. According to analysts, Macri's absence at the CELAC summit clearly demonstrates his intention to ward off Argentina's Latin American neighbours in order to pave the way towards free trade relations with the US and the EU. It is clear that Macri's policies will bring Argentina closer to the Pacific Alliance. And not only to that alliance, but also to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which already includes Asian nations that have a coastline on the Pacific. It is those nations that have some of the lowest paid workers on Earth. The fourth select summit will be attended by at least 20 heads of state who will discuss the eradication of poverty and the reduction of inequality in the region. Leo Politegaudi, Telesur. Buenos Aires. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos reacted to the United Nations announcement of a monitoring mission to accompany the peace process now, not there. President Santos greeted the UN's decision and he said the decision shows there is backing for the peace process from the whole world. With more on this major step in the peace process, we turn now to our correspondent Natalia Margarita. She's there in the capital of Bogota. The unanimous support from the United Nations Security Council has been widely welcomed in Colombia. All 15 members vote for the British sponsored resolution to monitor and verify Colombia's definitive bilateral ceasefire and the laying down of arms. It is important to remember that the Security Council is made up of countries that among them have very strong and long-standing intentions, and yet they have reached an agreement to unanimously adopt a resolution on an issue that is difficult and complicated. 
the United Nations will establish a political mission of unarmed international observers, initially for a period of 12 months, to monitor and verify on the ground the laying down of arms. For the government chief negotiator, Humberto de la Calle, this puts an end to a speculation about the future of the weapons. Lo que está claro es que no habrá armas. What is clear is that there will be no weapons in the hands of the FARC and that the guarantor of that for the international and national community is the United Nations. The laying down of arms will be carried out before the United Nations and I believe that's a key milestone in this process. Speaking at the Security Council, Foreign Minister Maria Angela Olguin thanked each and every member of the Security Council for their full commitment to a country that has decided to bring to an end decades of conflict and sorrow. For the United Nations and the international community, this is an opportunity for a success because they have been asked to support the implementation of an agreement to a conflict that is already being resolved by the parties involved through negotiation and dialogue. The UN Secretary General has already announced the beginning of preparations, including on the ground, to ensure that this political mission can be fully operational as soon as a final peace agreement is signed in Havana. Natalia Margarita, Telesur, Bogotá. A dramatic prison break to report to you in Brazil's Pernambuco state. Now, the jailbreak happened after an external explosion destroyed one of the prison walls there. Uh, authorities are investigating if the explosion was coordinated with the inmates inside. Six, 36 men were uh, recaptured and two others were killed by police. One inmate did manage to escape and he remains on the run. As well as the presidential campaign that is underway in Peru, candidates are also standing for the Andean Parliament, which supervises the relationships uh, between Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and Bolivia. With an explanation now, our correspondent in Peru, Raul Mora, reports. Keiko Fujimori, who aspires to become president of Peru, presented her party's candidates to the Andean Parliament, who will represent the country in an international entity. However, candidates such as Karina Nyaupari could not answer basic questions about what they would do if elected. What is the government plan of Keiko for the Andean Parliament? Good afternoon. Another of Keiko's candidates to the Indian Parliament who could not answer is Fernando Nieto. We can answer you starting tomorrow. We have a meeting right now with everybody in order to have our guidelines ready. But more or less, what is your opinion? We have new proposals to make it stronger. That is all I can tell you. For the renowned analyst Nelson Manrique, the lack of preparation found in candidates for public office is due to the deterioration of the parties within the neoliberal democratic system that reigns in the country. What we have is a group of acronyms and electoral clubs. There is no party system, and while there is no party system and there are no political careers, they have to recruit people any way they can. I think there are two criteria. First, people who can attract votes. There are no scruples involved. They choose people from show business, ethically questionable people. Second, they choose people who can bring in money. Under these circumstances, none of the six candidates that currently lead in the polls belong to consolidated political parties with established principles or with a presence that goes beyond personalities. Rael Mora, Telesur, Peru. On the east coast of the United States, in the northern section, uh, residents continue to dig out after what was historic snowfall over the weekend, which left 43 people dead. With more on a historic storm there, from New York to Virginia, we turned our correspondent, Bianca Perez. The northeast region of the United States continues its efforts to clean up after winter storm Jonas dumped up to three feet of snow in some parts of the country. 
the cleanup in the main cities has mostly gotten done in the main roads. Uh, as you can see, uh, the majority of downtown Washington, D.C. is now clear in its main roads. However, the sidewalks are still uh, something that is in the process of being cleaned, and it is very difficult uh, for people who are walking uh, to kind of get around in the city. Many of the people we've spoken to thus far have complained that uh, the mobility for pedestrians is, is very difficult still uh, in the city and in cities like New York City as well, uh, where they're trying to figure out where to put all of these tons upon tons of snow that fell uh, on both of these cities. It is important to remember that uh, as downtown is almost clean here in D.C., residential areas are still being affected by the snow. They have not seen a speedy cleanup, not as speedy as, as the main roads have. And uh, this has affected many of its residents and being able to get their cars out. Uh, another important factor of this storm is the economic impact that it has had. Uh, it is estimated thus far that $835 million is the economic impact that the storm has had in the businesses, not only um, here in the D.C. area, but just throughout the nation as well. This, of course, is an estimate, and as soon as this final number comes in, we will bring that to you. Bianca Perez, Telesur, Washington, D.C. Bianca Perez, they're reporting from a very chilly Washington, D.C., the capital there. We go around the world now. We turn to Syria, where the United Nations has invited both Syria's government and opposition, uh, the opposition there to peace talks in Geneva that will be held on Friday. Now, UN Special Envoy for Syria, Staffan de Mistura, sent out invitations earlier today, but no information has been supplied on who had been invited or how many groups might participate. However, the Syrian government has already said it will attend. The UN has stressed, has stressed that the peace talks must open humanitarian aid access to besieged areas. Meanwhile, Turkey says it will boycott the Syrian peace talks if the Kurdish Democratic Union Party or PKYD participates. Here's more. We are not against the Kurds. We are categorically against the EPJ and the PYD, who oppresses the Kurds, sitting at the table. That's the PYD there in Turkey. Now, despite criticism uh, by human rights groups, Denmark has approved its controversial migrant ass assets bill. This means police will be able to seize valuables worth more than $435 from refugees to cover housing and food costs. NPS also approved plans to delay families reunions for asylum seekers by three years. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, has sharply criticized Israel's settlement activities. Speaking at the Security Council, Ban described Israel's settlement building as, quote, provocative acts. And he also raised questions about Israel's commitment to a two-state solution. Palestinians urge for the release of force-fed hunger-striking journalist Mohammed Al-Kik. We turn more. For more now, we turn to our correspondent, Nor Harrison. The President's Media Office in the Gaza Strip held a press conference at the Adam Hotel west of Gaza City Tuesday morning in solidarity with Palestinian hunger-striking journalist Mohammed Al-Kik. The detained journalist began a hunger strike last November to protest for being held in Israeli jails under administrative detention. Spokesman of the prisoner's media office, Abdurrahman Jdaid, delivered a speech in which he held Israel ultimately responsible for the safety of the journalist's life and blamed the silence of the Palestinian Authority over his case. First, we hold the Israeli occupation completely responsible for the life of hunger striking prisoner Mohammed al Kik. And we consider his detention a, a criminal act which the occupation will pay a high price for inside and outside prisons. Second, we condemn the silence of the Palestinian Authority towards the cause of our prisoners. And we urge the PA officials to pressure Israel to ensure his freedom. Since the start of the Jerusalem Intifada in early October, Israeli violations against Palestinian journalists have escalated, and many of them were banned from covering incidents in several locations. 
According to a recent report published by human rights organizations, Israeli authorities committed 574 violations against Palestinian journalists in the occupied territories during 2015. The report revealed that two journalists were killed, 190 were wounded, and 85 others were arrested. In a clear violation to the international laws, the Israeli occupation forces have been using excessive force against Palestinian journalists in an attempt to silence the Palestinian voice which exposes their crimes against the Palestinian people. Nur Harazin, Trisu TV, Gaza. Over 5 million state workers across France rallied to protest reforms that have already seen over $7 billion in austerity cuts. Workers marched through the capital of France. Now, among the strikers were hospital workers and teachers. Later in the evening, taxi drivers joined in the protest by blocking key roads across Paris. South America's crisis hit soccer confederation, Conmebol, has elected its new president, Alejandro Dominguez. Now, the Paraguayan was unanimously elected into the position after uh, his only rival withdrew his candidacy. Now, Dominguez will seek to bring stability to the organization after months of turmoil involving arrests and resignations. And in Brazil now, the Samba Drone Parades are less than two weeks away. So members of the Grande Rio Samba School, which came third last year, are working around the clock to prepare for this year. They're putting the final touches on their colossal floats there and glitzy costumes ahead of the world-famous Carnaval. And that's what we're covering it today. Be sure to follow us on uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Also check us out on our website, telesertv.net slash English or Telesert English. I'm Cody Weddle. We'll see you back here tomorrow.